Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. OMG, we have Neil Milner here. Oh, oh Neil, Neil, <laughs> thanks for coming down. <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be my pleasure, but if that's what you're going to do, I don't know. No, no, thanks, thanks for having me, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> So welcome to the show, Neil. We're going to edit out the introduction. No, no, no. this is it. This the is whole it. Thing okay. You get. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, community I, matters. We're talking about politics. Why yes. not? Neil is a political commentator and a and a, and a writer, a, a columnist for uh, Civil Beat, which we admire very much. And uh, he'd been doing it since the day when he was teaching it at UH Manoa for about 70, 80 years or <laughs> yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. around there. Yes. <laughs> uh, take or yeah, take or leave a decade. Follows things on the about national 45. and the local. Yes. Today we're going to talk now. Yes. Okay, let's let's spring with the idea of the war on the press. What what that does for the Constitution, what it does for the press. I mean, it's, it's corrosive for the press. And the question, I suppose, is, um, you know, when you make your first attack, it's like Sumter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't have that much effect. It's that long grind where you keep attacking. And uh, so, you know, what is happening with the war on the press? Um, is it having some kind of secondary effect? Well, first of all, let's talk about the term war on the press. In some ways, it overestimates the problem, but in other ways, it underestimates the problem because most of what's going on is not really a direct attack in the sense that we're trying to license or that we're trying to explicitly uh, censor. And here I'm talking about both politicians, particularly Donald Trump, but also the, the, the people generally. I think what, what's the best way to describe it is this. You have a president who is clearly a norm violator when it comes to talking about constitutional issues, and the press is a good example. He's always making these criticisms of the press and these kind of oblique threats about how they should be regulated and so on. There hasn't been a lot of overt move in that direction, but but it's around there. At the same time, you and, and of course, the, the, the kicking up the ante by talking about fake news. We can come back to fake news later. Um, and so that's a more insidious, subtle kind of way that journalists have to worry more about. If you add that, if you add to that the fact that partly as a result of polarization and as a result of, of other kinds of things, the conservatives and liberals live in two different universes in many ways, and one of the ways is the way they see the press. So the idea of there being a kind of true, the idea that there's a truth or that there's an objectivity has become under fire, and not just not in just a philosophical sense. People don't think that the opposition is that the news that the opposition pays any attention to is valid. So to me, that's a more descriptive and a much more scary and at the same time realistic threat to the press than worrying about overt licensing or censoring. I'm not saying don't worry about those things, but even the journalist's response to this recent stuff from um, the Homeland Security was much more about the broader things rather than licensing right away. Well, I put it in the larger context just yeah. for them to get context. Um, you know, First Amendment, and uh, you know, one of the essential mechanisms in the Constitution is an informed public, right? Because otherwise, you can't vote properly. You, you can't make up your mind and be part of a, a kind of partnership of people who are all engaged in making better government. Um, and if you take away the information, the education, for that matter, uh, from the electorate, if you separate them from the truth, then you're undermining, you know, that particular mechanism in the Constitution. Um, so how important? is that? And is it more important now than it was? Is it getting less important? What's happening? Well, the first thing, to, I think there are two parts of that that are important. The first part, which is a little bit depressing, is the psychological part, that we know a lot more now about how people think, their political psychology, and so on. And we know two things. First of all, most people aren't very well informed. They don't pay much attention to politics. And there's some fairly understandable reasons for that. The second is that it turns out that the people who pay the most attention are 
are in many ways the least objective. Because when you pay attention to politics, you tend to be more committed to a certain kind of political values, and you tend to filter everything through those values. Now just put that aside. Just say, okay, so we're not nearly as good. It still is an important norm. The idea that there is information out there that we should be able to get that's reliable information, or at least debatable information in a civil sense, in the sense that we can question one another. Um, th that kind of norm is starting to disappear. And I worry much more about that one than I do about the psychological one. I mean, I'm not... I'm not a great, optimist, a great optimist about people's ability to engage in politics. They don't do it very much, and, and whatever the good government thing is or the patriotism is, it doesn't happen very easily. You can just look at Hawaiian voter turnout as an example. But doggone it, it is important that there's an ethical consensus on the idea that there is information out there that if you don't look for it, that you others would look for it and talk to you about it, that's reliable or at least debatable. And that, that I think, is increasingly missing. I don't know why, but I think of Captain Hornblower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I'll tell you Rick, why. Yeah, tell me one, why. One of the very many books about Captain Hornblower was where he was carrying a cargo of rice. Mm -hmm. And the water came in. He, he sort of cracked the hole somewhere, and the water came in. And it reached a tipping point where the rice began to swell, and, and it broke the hole, and the ship sank. And there was it's this tipping point that interests me. I mean, people are sure. written about tipping point. And I, and I really wonder, if I take you, hypothetically, to a place where we go beyond the tipping point, where nobody cares, nobody trusts the, the trust the press. Nobody is educated. Everyone is ignorant. Um, everyone is in a bubble, if you will, and the bubble is kind of artificial and, and not based on any reality. Um, if I take you to that place, can the government survive under the Constitution as we know it? Well, I don't know if we can survive. I don't mean that in the sense that we're going to be nuked or disappear. It seems to me that's a pretty awful world in which to live in, because essentially what you're saying is that there isn't any kind of meaningful way to engage in conversation with people who are different from you. And that we talk about the press as, you know, the, the distrust of the press. Distrust of the press has been around for a long time. It shows up more in the polls than it did before, but it's incredibly polarized. The, the, it's another big difference between liberals and conservatives or Democrats and Republicans. So that's, I, I don't, I despair of, of, of living in, in, a, in that kind of society. Tipping point, schmipping point, it's an awful place to have to put your head down and, and, and live. And I think that's the other part of democracy that people have to pay attention to. We pay a lot of attention to the procedural parts and the constitutional parts of it. But democracy requires a kind of way of living uh, that is accommodating that, that it's in, I, I think accommodation is even more important than engagement. Where uh, essentially, oh, you heard it here on think tech. Well, think yeah, but good, don't yeah. take that out of context. Certainly it's important to be engaged. Uh, but the, I think that they're starting to lack a sort of shared consensus about certain kind of norms that really make it hard for a democracy to operate. Some of the conservative writers actually do a pretty good job on this. David Brooks, who is an anti-Trump, both of the ones I'm going to mention are anti-Trump conservatives, but Russ Dusat, they, they write about the fact that democracy needs something else in addition to the kind of openness and fairness and, and you know, rule of law and equality and all those kinds of things. Well, let's take David Brooks in the New York Times for a minute. When I grew up and when you grew up in Pennsylvania? No, Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I thought the New York Times was the best things since sliced bread. I still think that. In yes. fact, I'm, I'm more impressed with them now because of their courage. Uh, not only in the Nixon period, you know, with the with the um, papers, what was it, the uh, yeah, uh, Pentagon Papers, Pentagon papers yeah. the movie recently, The Post, because the Times and The Post working. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, because they, they they stand fast and they and they maintain their standards all the time. But in the past week, I have run into two people here in Hawaii, ne, Hawaii ne, where I said, you see that article in The Times? And they said, in each case, they said, these are educated people. I don't read the Times. Oh, yeah. And the statement is, I don't believe anything in the Times. Therefore, I'm, it's the bubble. Yes. I'm not going to be there. Yes. Um, and, and that has changed. That, that is a new thing for me, because I always felt, you know, everyone agreed that Times was at the top. Sure. Um, 
this is a long conversation that could go in many directions, but just responding most directly to that, the, and, and I still think that uh, the Times is good. What you saw, I think, uh, from these two people, I don't know who they are, but I'm willing to guess, these are not the kind of redneck oh. Trump voters. That are, these are regular Republicans yeah. who have decided that it's a, it's a biased newspaper. Now, I think newspapers are, tend to be biased in ways that are not ideologically biased. Except your article in the Civil Beat. Well, that's boring. It's a B <laughs> word, but it's boring. You're not biased. Um, the, but, I, but I have the same thing with, with um, some of my relatives back east who are conservatives. It's, it's just dismissive. You find people doing the same thing with Fox News. But I think uh, there, it's, it's interesting what's happened to the Times. I think the Times is a really good newspaper. I don't think the bias that many Republicans feel about it is that they're emphasizing things about Trump that the Republicans don't think are important. And that's probably true. You can see that as bias, or you can see it as I want to learn about that thing. So even though I disagree that it's that, even though I don't think it's so important that, that Donald Trump probably paid off the porn star, <laughs> I want to learn about it. But you see, what's happened is that it's gone from I don't think it's important to I don't even want to pay attention to it because the newspaper is yeah, biased. Yeah, yeah. And you have to remember though, the New York Times circulation has gone way up since Trump. Yeah. Um, and I don't. I think the Post. I think the Post probably has should, to. if it has but, but that's, to me, it, and, and it's a reminder of, of something that I said a little while ago, that it's educated, intelligent people with a set of political values that are often the least willing to engage in an opposing view. So let me ask you a question I've been dealing with. You've been asking myself. me a question. I mean, you know, yeah, here we question. are together, Neil. Yeah. So he's he's at war with the press. Yes, it, it started almost immediately. Really, it started during the campaign, right? Um, and now uh, we have we have a dynamic going on in the way people see the press. Yes, and not only television but newspapers, everything. Uh, and there's a, there's a greater distrust, I would say, from one bubble across to the other bubble. Um, do you agree that the reason, or one of the big reasons, if not the exclusive reason? is his war in the press has diminished public confidence in the press. Well, it has, but I mean, he's, he's certainly a visible catalyst, and he's certainly, um, I, the best term, the, the politest term I can use is a norm buster in doing it. I mean, I find the way that he, you know, I find the way he talks really disgusting. Now, I am sure it's related to the fact that I would not ever vote for Donald Trump. But I think that there is something else going on here that you have to remember, and that is the extent to which we, that is, the American society, no longer share common news uh, sources. The network news, you know, we used to watch, um, well, we used to watch John Cameron Swayze. You, you remember Gabriel Heater? Yeah, and well, really, these guys were giants. Well, they were giants. They were giants. Everything well, they said. Yeah, it's easier to be a giant if you don't have competition. <laughs> People were getting news from the same kind of sources. Local news was better than it was then. And what's changed now is social media certainly changed it. Um, on radio, you have you have large corporations that are that are like Sinclair uh, that are pretty conservative and, and bring it out there. So it isn't just it isn't just Trump, and Trump's, of course, war with the press started well before he was president, because his view is, if the press gives me good publicity, I like him. If they don't, I have the well, critique This goes way it. back. It goes, yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a media guy. Yeah. So, so I think it's important to understand the, the, the kind of norm-breaking threat that Trump is, and the way that people in responsible political positions, the, the Paul Ryans of the world and all those kinds of things, let him let him get away with it, but it's certainly a bigger problem than that. If you look at where people get news, and you look at people's propensity to believe false statements, then you get to see what, what broader problem there is. Yeah, and one of the things I've noticed, and this is relevant to our next, uh, our next half after the break, is that sometimes his agency heads, or people he appoints, are actually singing his song. Sure. So you have a sort of multiplication of effort. Um, and you can, you can lay down your, your agenda, so to speak, through others. And they take it as far well, as they go. They're I mean, loyal to him. You well, know? you're supposed to be if you're a cabinet-level official. Yeah. You know, th that's the thing that's, that always has 
annoyed me about people who oppose Trump, and that is somehow they expect the cabinet officials, not to mention, to, to be some kind of martyrs to the cause. I mean, first of all, they may actually believe in this stuff. And even if they don't believe in this stuff, look, if you get a group of cabinet officials, uh, you know, 35 minutes after, the, for, during the first cabinet meeting, where they swear allegiance to this guy publicly in the way that we would swear allegiance to what? Howdy duty? I can't even think of an example. You get a sense of what the dynamic is like. And so I'm not surprised that they're loyal. I'm certainly not surprised that Scott Pruitt is loyal. I'm surprised at how, what's the word I'm looking for, enthusiastic he is <laughs> um, in taking apart the environment. But that you can't, you can't expect people working for the guy to behave differently. I wrote a column a long time ago about, what was his name, the first, the, the first uh, press secretary. And I said, oh, Sean. Sean, I said, look, if you're working for a bad boy, Boss, you're going to behave badly, especially in that position, because what else are you going to do? And, but yeah. the flip side of that is yeah. that if your cabinet, all the, the people who are loyal sure. and faithful to you, um, are saying the same thing, and the public gets the idea, they don't understand that you know the, sure. uh, the, the finesse here. The public gets the idea that all these people are agreeing it must be true. And, and after the break, you know, I would yeah. like to talk to you about Sinclair. Okay. Sinclair Broadcasting Group, and I would also like to talk to you about the Department of Homeland Security that's collecting data on you and me, I'm, yep. I'm very sure. Yeah, well, we will be in that. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> if we were before, we are yeah. now. It that's doesn't say you have to be a good journalist, it just says you have to write. So you and I both make it. Okay. <laughs> I'm honored. We'll be right back after this break. <laughs> Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DT. Captain of our team. It's the DT. For every game day, assign a designated driver. I hope you didn't forget what we're doing here today. This is Community Matters with Neil Milner, okay? And uh, if I didn't mention it before, we're talking about the journalist list at the Department of Homeland Security. We're going to get to that in a minute. And I guess the, the tagline to sort of work to is what can we expect next? So first, let's talk about Sinclair Broadcasting Group. This is, the, this is very disconcerting because, as you mentioned earlier, people, especially the people in the hinterland, do not trust the national media. More, they trust the local media. Now the local media has a uniform agenda through the methodology of Sinclair. Let me add one other thing, is that uh, before um, the uh, Federal Communications uh, Commission uh, stopped mergers like this, but now there's a new chair appointed by President Trump who is probably going to force the approval um, of, a, of an acquisition by Sinclair of Tribune Broadcasting Group, uh, netting out something like 400 local TV radio stations in the hinterland of the United States. And they're all apparently free uh, to broadcast on an agenda basis out of Maryland, one message to everywhere, and people trust that. Does this concern you? Oh yeah, it concerns me from a lot of different ways. It, it isn't that they're doing, it isn't simply that they're doing one message, although that's, a, that's one problem, I'll get back to it. It's also that the message has to do with a very explicit statement about fake news and bias that has all kinds of code words in there that says distrust anybody who doesn't think the way we do. The other problem with, with this is because it's centralized is that for a variety of reasons, local news has become diminished 
over the years. It's become diminished because the newspapers have disappeared. It's become diminished because uh, uh, local media, particularly TV, because local radio news isn't very big anymore, local TV spends a smaller percentage of its time on local issues than on national issues. And it's a chicken versus the egg thing, because people care, care less about local things and more about national things. And to me, that's really warped, because I think your life is much more local than national. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so you do have you do have that kind of problem, plus this concentration of this concentration of ownership. The old argument used to be that you don't give much control to each to any particular owner because you want to have diversity and you don't want to have a monopoly of information. We're certainly moving away from this and, and Sinclair is doing so in a much more overt sort of way. So, you know, you're going to find Sinclair stations spending less time on local news than they did uh, before. Yeah, and we, we found a video online where they took like, I don't know, 50 or more yeah. uh, newscasters and they synchronized the message and they were all using precisely the same words Great. at precisely the same times over the course of the broadcasting week. And our people in the audience, they don't realize that, but in fact, they're getting a, a national message. It's like a media version of the Handmaiden's Tale, right? I mean, really, <laughs> this is really kind of Orwellian that you're going to do it. But essentially, there isn't any kind of um, easy legal control of that anymore. Uh, the fairness well, not this administration. Not, well, that's right. This is this is building, taking advantage of, of all kinds of other things that allow this. The really troublesome thing about this is this is happening at the same time as we get the, the grind of the regular attacks on the press from sure. Washington. It's happening at the same time as, uh, as uh, 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 Zuckerberg yeah. and um, uh, the Russians uh, are all trying to, to affect public opinion on that, on that large scale basis, a demographic basis with group psychology that you mentioned. Sure. All these things are, are having an effect on group psychology and if all those messages are similar, whoa, uh, you know, where's the Constitution now when a few people can give these repeated messages? If I get five messages from five different sources that seem to be different, I'm really going to get convinced about that. Mm -hmm. Repetitio mater studiorum. <laughs> if I repeat it over and over again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start believing it. And I think that's what's happening. So when you take it together, all these vectors, you know, the sure. cumulative effect is very threatening. Well, and you also have to remember what we're like when we come when we deal with processing of information. If anything we've learned, in fact, basically people won Nobel Prizes for this kind of research, simply this is that the power of narrative, the power of a story is the way people tend to think and tend to react. That the most powerful way you can influence a person is to tell them a story. And that has a profound effect on how we process narrative. The other, the other thing that's important here is that we don't have a good filter, a good immediate filter for truth versus falsity. And in fact, some recent research shows we're more inclined to accept false stuff on the internet than true stuff on the internet. So you have all of these things working together. And that's another thing I think people have to understand about this administration and Trump, a lot of our, a lot of the way we think politically, in fact, almost all of the ways that people tend to think politically, their deep psychology, which they're not even always aware of, their partisanship, their values, that process is pretty stable and pretty well established. And so you're not finding out anything dramatically new about the way people think about the way they accept information, how you influence them. But what you have is a much more overt attempt to do it now. Um, and so you have two kind of scary things at the same time. One is our ability to process which, as I say, is not is far from good. And at the same time, you have a much more overt notion of not seeing an, ob an objective truth and having a much more propagandistic way of doing And you have thing. very sophisticated mechanisms sure. that are able to reach millions of people. Well, you have some sophisticated mechanisms. You're right. And, and I mean, in Cambridge Analytics, once you get through the BS, I mean, they, they gave whoever bought their stuff a pretty good sell job about what they could do, but they clearly could do a lot of stuff. But at the same time, there's nothing sophisticated about talk show hosts. I mean, you know, right? They say that they, they're, they're, they're uh, media people like you. No, I mean, Rush Limbaugh is the same. He knows how to influence people. He knows how to talk to them. So, but but that's, that's, and that's a good example of the power of a story. So, um, and 
and, and all of what we've been saying here really is a context for trying to, to uh, toward the reactions about this Homeland Security thing, both what you said about Zuckerberg, what we've been talking about here, because that it creates a kind of, I guess we should say something about this before I go on into my spiel about the effect of it. So you want to talk a second about what, what, what got you interested in? in oh yeah, well, the, the, the thing that really excited me was the uh, announcement by a woman named Kirsten, um, Kirsten Nielsen. Nielsen, thank yeah. you, who is the recently appointed new um, director of Homeland Security, which she, if you see her photograph, she does not look like a director of Homeland no, Security. No, no, it, it's kind of refreshing there. Yes, that's right, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, apparently from her or her staff comes this idea, and, and I always feel, as I said before, that these appointees are loyal to the guy who appointed yeah. them, and maybe this idea came from outside Homeland Security, but she came up with this idea about creating a database of all the journalists and the people who affect, who influence the news giving in this country. In fact, in the world, I think. It mm -hmm. goes beyond this mm -hmm. country, uh, including bloggers. Uh, anyone who expresses an opinion to uh, an audience, so to speak, and I'm sure that includes you and me. I'm sure you know, that includes all the people we know in this community who are involved in news. <clears throat> and uh, the, the, the problem that goes beyond even the list is that the list includes a database field called uh, sentiments. Sentiment, yes. Sentiments. Yes. Now, you know, that's, a, that's a euphemism, really, because sentiments is what's your opinion on mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. on this, on that, and the other thing. I, I bet you there's you know, 27 fields about your sentiments on this issue and that issue and so forth. They can paint you in well, whatever corner they want. There's, that there's, they have to build a search engine in to look for those they things. Which they, yeah, they do. I mean, that's part of the specs. Yeah. yeah. So when this happens, then you think of, uh, you think of uh, the Olympic Stadium there in, uh, in Berlin uh, back in 1990. 1936 and 7, you say to yourself, this is how you really scare the pants off the press. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you have the ability to target individuals who speak against you. Scary. Yeah. Well, the press has been, uh, the, the, the group of reporters that, uh, that kind of uh, reporter organization responded and said, look, what you have to understand about this for now is that it's not an overt attempt to license us, it's not an overt attempt to censor us, but there's all kinds of things to worry about here. And w just just to fill in a little bit, what they want is a database, including names, addresses, uh, publications, um, and kind of viewpoints of about, they figure about 300,000 people. In the country. In, in the country, right. And they, and so so the, the request for uh, a proposal, the request for who can do this, and you have to have an easy uh, password uh, associated thing to be able to search them. So, and, and the argument that the Homeland Security makes, and by the way, this comes from the cybersecurity part of Homeland Security, doesn't come from the press office. So, and I'm not sure, I mean, this has probably been floating around for a while, and Nielsen is far, probably new, and there's a good chance that some people had this kind of idea in, in the, the Obama administration. So what you'd be able to do is search. Now, the, the journalists say there are two things to worry about here, one of which is, what are they going to use that for in regard to us? Are they going to use that to make it harder for us to uh, get access? Are they going to be snooping on us? The other thing is that this organization, that this sub-bureaucracy that is putting this together, or, or having someone put it together for them, is the organization in charge with vetting. And so this information could be used to vet journalists from other countries from, from coming into the United States. Those are the more immediate kind of concerns. And, I, and so the, the guy from Homeland Security responds by saying, you guys are all conspiracy theorists. He sends a tweet. That's the only, sends a tweet out. He says, you know, you guys are like the black helicopter people. You got nothing to worry about. We're just collecting data There's here. no deep state. There's no deep state. Well, this, you're right. This is a kind of, it's not deep reaches this way. So, but in this day and age, I mean, think about what's happened recently. First of all, the whole thing with, with uh, uh, Cambridge Analytics and with Zuckerberg has pointed out something that was visible in plain sight. They're in the data gathering business. They have a business model that allows people to package a whole lot of data, big data. And in fact, big data is as much a creation in politics of liberals as it is of conservatives. Now. Uh, Cambridge Analytics may have violated the agreement because I guess I guess the agreement went something like this. Um, 
Facebook says you can't use it for this, for whatever, X. And they said, okay. Um, and that was it. And then guess what? Okay, it turned out not to be the case. But this whole question of privacy and the whole question of the implications of gathering data. I mean, a lot of this is, is if you would just say, we're going to gather a lot of data about journalists because we want to follow what's going on. And we're Homeland Security, and it's a way to increase intelligence, okay? But in this day and age, why would you believe that about any kind of uh, government bureaucracy? And there are federal laws that exist about what government can collect in terms of dossiers. So that's why this thing is, that's why this thing is particularly, what would be interesting thing to me, it's a thought experiment, we can't do it, is if you had a liberal as president and it was Homeland Security under that administration that said, we want to do this, how liberals would react to this? I don't know. Um, the cynic in me says it all depends on, on what side you're on. But, that's, but I worry about this kind of, and I also worry about the fact that my assumption always is that there's no data that's protected. I run my life that way now. I mean, I never, I write short emails. If I ever insult you, it's going to be in person. I'm not going <laughs> to, you'll have no record. So <laughs> people are changing the way they do. Oh, well, no, that's, that's right. And, and so there's all, you know, I, I worry about the potential of hacking. I worry about all kinds of other things here. That's why um, you can't simply say here, you know what, we're just gathering data. That's a kind, he's not going to get away with that politically. That's way too dismissive, and I think he probably knows that. The reporters who tried to follow up got nothing else other than that a copy of that tweet that he sent out. <laughs> but that's that's why it's a significant and, ser and a serious it's, issue. It's funny how Brave New World in 1984 oh, yeah. playing out in, right in front of our eyes. And, and you talk about the change in administration. So they could have a very pure, if not angelic, reason for setting this up. But the next administration, whether sure. whatever it is, is it may decide we, we need to use this data for some other purpose. Oh yeah, and we think they're you know we think educated people are bad, and we have to send them to camps, whatever it is. Well, when we were talking before about distrust as if it's a bad thing, sometimes I mean the part of a, the part of the dynamics of a democracy is always to be distrustful and skeptical. You always remember your political leaders are human. Uh, accountability means I'm watching you. I don't trust you enough to be you know, and that's part of the democratic process. So that. That's certainly an issue that you have to consider here, but I think under this situation, under the fraught circumstances that we're now in in this country, it's a particularly it's a particularly frightening. So I have two remaining questions for you, Neil. Sure. Uh, these are one you suggested you would answer later, and that is, what is the effect of all this? What is the effect of the war? on the press and Sinclair and the Homeland Security and the attack you know, on the press in general. Um, what, what is the effect of that on our lives individually as members of the press and the country in, in, within the democratic framework? Well, to me, the, to me, I see it as a sense of despair. There, there's clearly some things happening where you, you distrust information, where the notion of truth and objectivity and science uh, begins to disappear. Here, that what's happened, for example, is that scientific questions have become politicized. And so um, uh, public health questions and even climate change is a good example. People, instead of looking toward science for their cues on how to react, look toward politics and how to do it. And so you, you, tend to review, you tend to view it the same way you view a candidate. You don't want to pay any attention to the other side. And so that's, that's part of the problem that has happened here. I think that it's... I don't, you, you're, you know, you're better off asking reporters. It doesn't strike me that the New York Times um, or the big papers are any more chilled in the sense of, of, um, of how they do it. But I think the atmosphere in which they work is a very, very difficult atmosphere. If I, if I attack Amazon, yeah, because Bezos happens to own oh, the Washington Post. Post, and is know? making money on it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very troubling. No, it is troubling. It's, it, it's to me, it's disgusting. Um, and I know that for sure. And I know that no good can come out of it. But I don't know how other people are reacting. My guess is that people react to Trump's attack on Bezos considering what polarization is like, the same way they react to almost every major issue right now and every, uh, not just policy issue, but everything that Trump does. The conservatives and Republicans like it, 
Democrats hate it. And, and that's just the reflection of everything from his you know, from his approval rating, which is relatively low, but it's like 80% among Republicans approve and 20%. It's really interesting yeah. how that works. Oh, yeah, and that's really unprecedented. And so I think that part of why, why I despair about this is that you have some people who are intensely worried about this and other people who are really happy that the that, uh, journalists are taking all this crap, they deserve it, they're unbiased, <laughs> and I want to remind you that this is not, you know, this is not your, your unemployed steel worker in Pennsylvania. No, you guys with PhDs? Yeah, well, you have PhDs, yes, or as I say, old white guys like me, who of course are very likely to be Republicans and, um, and certainly feel that way. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the dynamic that really worries me. But you haven't, you haven't talked about how this is going to affect the uh, midterms, because in fact, you know, uh, there'll there be midterms? more of this. Oh, are there midterms? I don't know. What yeah. midterms? Oh, yeah. What are you be, talking about? Oh, yeah. Sure. Um, well, it's going. You never know. I mean, the, the, I always think about elections, and even the 2018, in terms of what's stable rather than what's different. You've got all this noise going on, and all of these kinds of crazy things that are happening, and the un, uh, surprising things like Paul Ryan quitting, and um, now a record number of Republicans. It's like a reality show, eh? I, I just, yeah, I never watched reality. Well, the only one I ever liked was the, was Ice Truckers. <laughs> but that's that's me. Yeah. That's great, but I, anyway, you know, it's one that, that's where they drive, the, the, the long distance haulers drive on these roads in Alaska in the winter, it's great. Uh, but, <laughs> make a note, <laughs> yeah, make a note. I don't even know if it's still on. But I think the, uh, you know, I think that the midterms, issues like the press, issues like those sorts of things really don't have much resonance. People don't pay, when it comes to election time, if people pay uh, very much attention at all, it doesn't seem to be. Remember how many times you said during the 2016 campaign, uh-oh, Trump has really done it to himself this time. He can't possibly recover from yeah, this. Right. And you were only off by 100%, right? <laughs> Everything you thought was going to do him in, including, of course, the Surprise. pussy tape. And you should learn something about politics there, at least, and that is that people have a fairly stable, I cannot even imagine what, you know, so the, and I don't think the Russian investigation is going to be definitive by that time. You know, you're a lawyer, you know that the first thing you look at is how long we'll have a there. crisis over Mueller before we <laughs> yeah, have a result. Well, we might. That's yeah. right. But but these things, the, the, the time thing. So the 2018 election, I think, is going to depend a lot on the usual sorts of things that you can see you know, right now. Um, Last question. Sure. <clears throat> okay, I'm concerned about this. I told you I'm concerned. There's a lot of people concerned. You're concerned. Yeah. Um, what can we do about it? I mean, if we care a lot, if we believe that, you know, our lives and fortunes are at risk somehow, and who's to say when they come for us, you know? Yeah. But when they do come for us, it will be a bad time. So how do we pre prevent that? How do we, what action do we take? We meaning all of us. Yeah, I think, I mean, whether, whether it helps you or hurts you to think about this idea of coming for us is really a personal decision. My own sense is that if I go to that place, it's going to create so much apathy and so much despair that I would rather think about it in the sense of saying, look at all this crap that's going on that I hate. Uh, let's not worry about the, those far things. What can I do now? And you know what? I really don't have a good answer. I don't have a good answer. I, I mean, I can give you the stock answer, which is to say, get more involved in things that bother you. Um, and that's easy. I also. One of the things that I say, and you and I were talking about something like this before, is that if you don't like the way the world is going, pick out a part of the world, your world, in which you can have some effect. And that tends to be the place where you live. There's some really interesting literature about how all through the United States there are pockets of people doing neighborhood work, I don't mean just charity work, neighborhood development, working together on projects that tends to be diverse, people are diverse, different kind of political things, um, different kind of political beliefs. Those beliefs aren't so important if you're trying to figure out how to get graffiti off a wall. That's another way to do it. You're, you don't want to let what you call the world and the big picture determine what your life is going to be about. So that's another kind of thing. The trouble with, with advocating for more political involvement is that I, it's good. I would always advocate for it, but it doesn't, it's very hard to get people motivated. There's just a, 
just a real quick thing. I talked on the radio yesterday about this recent study in Public Opinion Quarterly, right? So these guys took a real close look at the 2016 election, interest in the election, voter turnout, uh, watching cable news, the amount of expressed interest you have watching the debates, and they said, look, this is what this is what the media said about 2016 that it was it was a campaign like we've never seen before. Here is the data. It turns out it wasn't very different. It was a very ordinary. People's interest didn't change. Uh, they didn't watch the debates. They didn't come anywhere close to the number of people watching debates as to watch the Reagan debates. Voter turnout was okay, and the only difference was early in the campaign. In the primaries, there was a higher than average interest. Otherwise, and so one of the things they said, it should remind you all that, first of all, the media tends to have a trope about change and excitement that is misleading. That's kind of the nature of what you do if you're in the media. The, but the second thing is, it should remind all of us how hard it is to change people's engagement in politics. Now, we're watching this wonderful, courageous example of the young kids, including people who went through this awful trauma, of, of going to bat. But the idea that they can sustain that in any kind of meaningful way, or that that'll affect the rest of us politically, it, it, it's the thing. So I would be, I learned my lesson about, about confident punditry when I was going around telling everybody how Trump was going to lose and why. So I'm a lot more careful. But I think it's nuts. If anybody says to you, we've got a formula other than this kind of good government blather that says participate more in politics. Well, okay. I mean, you know, it's like saying to a, a, a husband and wife, you should communicate more. <laughs> you know, it's probably right. It's a good idea, but it doesn't do any good to say it. It has to be a much more sustained thing over time. If I ask you this question again in six months, I have the same answer. answer. No, same no, answer. I think I'll probably have, because, I mean, I might be wrong about, I notice I didn't say anything about the outcome of the election in 2000. 2018, because I'm really still up in the air. But I would be, uh, the, the only difference, here's the, what the difference might be. I may be wrong about, um, well, I'm not, I'm not predicting that these, the, the students won't have that great amount of effect. I'm just saying people should not be so optimistic about it, and you should not let these kids carry your water for you by labeling them as courageous. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> That that there may be a difference, but I don't think you know, I, I don't think other than that I'd be likely to say anything that different. But as I, it's only been a short period of time before I was really wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe so, you'd be wrong again. Back. That's right. <laughs> you can, here's what: if you have me back, you put me up in one of those charity things where you're hanging on a chair yeah, over the water, right. you know, yeah, the dunk yeah. thing. And so if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and you can you know you can throw that at me. So you know we're. <laughs> Out of time, Neil. Yeah, it's Neil Milner, uh, pr professor of political science and uh, uh, political um, uh, commentator, and uh, writes for Civil Beat. Uh, Neil Milner, who we've all known for years and years, who has commented on so many things in our world. Neil Milner, an expert who is sometimes wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. It's like doing these with you is like doing it over, you know, over beers, except there's never any beer. <laughs> Next time, Next Neil. Time. Okay.